I was asked in the comments if I could talk a bit about legal professional privilege and public interest immunity. Uh, well, a bit might be pushing it a bit, but um, I'll have a little ramble, see what you think. Okay, so what is this in relation to? It's about disclosure, okay? The rules in litigation, whether sim civil or criminal, are that you have to disclose certain information to the other side. With a civil case, generally speaking, you're supposed to disclose any material that might relate to the case. Um, now, disclosure has to be proportionate. So in a simple case, like, you know, small claims, the, the order might just say, look, just serve on the other side the material you're going to rely on in the trial. However, the normal order is that you should do a search for anything that is potentially relevant. Then what you do is you do a disclosure schedule where you say to the other side, here's all the material we hold, and then the other side can come back and say, OK, we would either like copies or to inspect the following items. Sometimes um, you get what we call the key to the filing cabinet disclosure, where people just say, you know what, come around and look at anything you want. Um, like I say, um, it varies from case to case. But sometimes there might be material you say, well, we, we have this material, but we don't think it should be disclosed. Sometimes that's just because you say it's not relevant. But the two most common um, issues are legal professional privilege. And in criminal proceedings, although it can actually occur in civil proceedings, uh, public interest immunity. So what's the first one? Well, the idea is, the rationale behind this is, that people in litigation should be able to speak frankly to their lawyers and lay their cards on the table. Although, if I remember, I'll put in the end screen about the classic what to do if a client tells you they're guilty. Um, but, you know, the idea is people can speak frankly, discuss options, discuss things like settlement, all that sort of thing, and just the merits of the case, and that doesn't have to be shown to the other side. You know, your chats with your lawyers are confidential. But it has to be genuinely seeking legal advice. So, for example, and this cropped up in the post office inquiry, material that was produced prior to any thought of litigation, generally speaking, that can attract legal professional privilege. Because the test is, it's either to be used, you know, it's discussing things about litigation that's ongoing or in contemplation of litigation. So say, for instance, you think there might be legal proceedings on the horizon, either you bringing a claim um, or you defending a claim, and you start to speak to your lawyers at that stage. Well, that can attract legal professional privilege. But it has to be things about the case, and it has to be about legal advice. So internal documents you know, between non-lawyers, like, say, just post office staff, that probably wouldn't attract legal professional privilege. There is a little bit of a joke, actually, especially among American lawyers, where all emails are CCing in legal for privilege reasons. In other words, just by linking the lawyers in the email, you can argue, well, you know, we're inviting them to comment on this. Uh, so that makes it legally privileged. That's not um, always the case. Also, you can't use legal pro professional privilege to cloak wrongdoing. So, you know, you can't conspire to pervert the course of justice or, or any crime, even if you're discussing it with your lawyers. Hey, you know, if we were to do this bank robbery, <laughs> what would be our best chances of money laundering the proceeds? You know, that, that would not be protected. Um, but generally speaking, anything else, any statement made, whether it's in writing or orally, um, so, you know, taking instructions, preparing witness statements, getting experts reports. I mean, that can actually get a bit, confu a bit complicated because there can be times when, for instance, you are ordered to disclose draft expert reports. You know, here's an expert's report saying we win. Yeah, but let's see all the earlier ones before you had a chance to sit down with them and discuss your case, <laughs> you know, and say, oh, I don't like that. Can you remove that? Um but that's legal professional privilege. And the general rule is that that is not disclosable. What's public interest immunity? Um, this is what we used to call crown privilege. Now, I'll, I'll try to keep the rambling down a bit, and I won't go on about the history of this. Uh, but it's now called public interest immunity. 
And that is where a state body, usually in criminal proceedings, but can be in civil proceedings as well, says, for valid reasons, this is evidence that might be you know, relevant and admissible. However, for public policy reasons, we don't think it should be disclosed to the defence. Now, this crops up a lot in criminal trials, and quite often it's just like really simple things like, uh, say for instance, somebody's done some observations, you know, oh, we watched um, street drug dealing or something like this, and we filmed all this, or we observed all this from a particular flat. Then they might say, we'd rather not disclose whose flat we use, because, you know, there might be retaliation or revenge against the people who let us use, um, use the flat. I mean, in the post office, though, there's one, and I'm trying to find out more about this, there was a public interest immunity um, application in relation to the second site report about all the bugs in the Horizon software. Um, and that succeeded. The judge said, yes, you don't have to disclose that to the defence. And that seems an unusual decision. Uh, I'm not suggesting any, you know, the judge did anything wrong there, but I'm really trying to find out which judge did it. I mean, part of the problem here is, although notes should be taken um, during uh, a public interest immunity um, application, for, for obvious reasons, they're not usually in the public domain. But what, how do these procedures work? Well, what you do is um, you say to the judge, effectively, we have some material here that possibly is disclosable, but we don't want to disclose it for these you know, operational security reasons or what, whatever. Uh, there are three ways of making the application. Sometimes they're done where the prosecutor will say to the defence, look, this is the material we've got, and tell you what it is, you know, it might be something like, look, it's the, it's the names and address of the people who let us use their property, or something like that. They'll tell you, and you can actually make representations in open court about it. You know, they'll say, we want to just keep this secret, and the defence can say, well, no, no, we need to know this. I mean, it's always a bit silly, this, because you can usually work out where they were filming from, <laughs> just by sort of going to the scene and working out and going, all right, the camera must have been up there. Um, but that's one way of doing it. Sometimes they will do it without the defence present. They won't disclose everything, but they'll give a general you know, hint to the defence what it's about. Oh, this is about um, some phone tapping, or this is about some bugs. Um, so the defence might say, before they go in and have the hearing in private, well, Your Honour, we'd like you to bear in mind the following X, Y and Z. But they can also do this without notice, where they just go to the judge, they don't even tell the defence, and say we want to make an application for public interest immunity. And they don't even want defence to know that has been going on. Uh, because, you know, it's meant to be super, super secret squirrel. Now, like I've mentioned before, this can be a bit artificial, because I was involved in a lengthy drug case once, where the prosecutor made a PII application, and it was so secret, he wouldn't even let his junior attend. And we were all in the pub next door to the court while well, this was going on with the people from it, from, from Customs and Excise who were prosecuting the case. And they told us what it was all about. It was actually about um, some surveillance things, but it was also about phone intercepts and bugging. There's a rather weird rule in um, English criminal procedure that if there has been phone tapping, you're not allowed to actually put the transcripts of the phone taps, if it's on a regular phone network, into evidence. It's all very artificial because that doesn't apply if you intercept, say, between, like if it's a wireless handset and you intercept between the handset and the receiver, then the rules don't apply. Um, also, it's things like it doesn't apply to, you know, push-to-talk radios and things like that. And, you know, it gets very complicated. Does it apply to internet phone calls and voice over internet protocol and things like that. So, also, you're not allowed to even mention that, the, that a warrant has been granted to allow the phone tapping. Um, now, in this particular case, we were quite glad. We didn't really care. We, were, we wanted the prosecution to succeed because, obviously, all the phone evidence showed our people were, like, completely guilty. So we were quite glad that they were saying we, should, we don't want to disclose to the defence that we were bugging their cars and bugging their vehicles. Um, so we were, we were quite happy for them to succeed on that one. I mean, people might think that's a rather artificial situation. and go, well, hang on, if you've got phone intercepts, 
that show that they have committed the offence. Why isn't that admissible? I mean, our American American lawyers watching this will probably be going, "What? Hang on, um, this is." I mean, American phone tapping rules are all very interesting as well. You know that they can only listen for forty seconds, and if they don't start talking about a crime within forty seconds, they've got to hang up or two minutes. I mean, it keeps changing. But yeah, that 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 is one of the rules here. Um, but the test for the judge is okay. Can there still be a fair trial if we don't disclose this material? Now, like I said, sometimes a judge will say, well, yeah, I mean, you not knowing who the name of the flat owner was, how does that affect your defence? So, yeah, I'm going to allow that. A judge may, though, say, well, actually, no, this material, they can make something out of this. Because the test for disclosure in criminal proceedings, which the post office don't seem to know, is that it may assist the defence or undermine the prosecution. And and that's the test, may, not that it will, just that it might. So it's a very low threshold. So a judge might say, well, no, they they can't properly defend themselves. Or it may be the defence would want to follow up on this line of inquiry. Uh, Then the prosecution have a choice. They can either agree to the material being disclosed or they can drop the case. Sometimes there'll be a compromise. A judge will say, and this is why I'm surprised with the horizon, with the second sight report, they might say, okay, what exactly are you objecting to in there about getting out? And it might be, they said, oh, well, this goes to show how our procedures work, and if this information is in the public domain, it opens up to hacking or something like that. The judge could say, well, okay, how about you serve a redacted report? So you get rid of all the your passwordy stuff and the technical stuff, but the report as a whole goes in. Or you can do it by way of what we call admissions. Admissions are where, in, in cases, and again, you can do this in criminal cases or civil cases. Usually when you do it in civil case, sometimes you'll call it agreed facts or something. But that's where, to save time, you just do a big list of things that aren't in dispute. And, you know, you give that to the judge or the jury. You say, you don't have to worry about this. We agree the following evi- the following facts are true. So we're not going to waste time calling evidence or something. And you just do a big schedule. So it could be that, you know, the prosecution would make an, admit- an admission. Yes, um, you know, we are happy to concede that, yes, these people were actually, we were acting on information received from an informant. We're not going to tell you who the informant is or anything like that. But, yes, we are happy to ad- admit that... We only found out about this matter because somebody told us about it, um, you know, something like that. So, so th- those are the two main ones, like I say, legal professional privilege and public interest immunity. I mean, sometimes the public interest immunity, uh, there was a case, it was about the sinking of a submarine. And, you know, obviously all the families of the people who'd been lost wanted to, you know, they sued um, the, the Ministry of Defence and the government um, but there was a public interest immunity thing there because they said, well, if we reveal how the accident was caused, that will show how our submarines operate and indeed, you know, reveal a, a, a particular flaw in submarine de- design that perhaps in the middle of the Cold War we don't want people to know about. Uh, so that was, the judge said, we accept here that we are denying people justice and finding out exactly what happened to their relatives, but the public interest is such that this material cannot be disclosed. There was another submarine case, actually, where... The, the, the issue was it was about the way hydrogen peroxide reacts with copper and it blew up a torpedo, which took, up, uh, took out a submarine. And interestingly, that, that's what brought the Kursk down. We, we modified our torpedoes after that, but we didn't tell anybody that was a problem. But, and, and, you know, but that, that hydrogen peroxide reacting with copper is what um, blew the front of the Kursk off. So, you know, but the, 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 you know, the, the, I think hopefully you can see what the rationale is behind it. But of course the danger is it can be you know, abused. I mean, like I say, legal professional privilege, it is a bit of a joke that people will just copy in lawyers just to try and artificially make documents um, inadmissible. And similarly, I mean, normally, you know, in my experience, prosecutors have always been really fair about PII applications. Uh, they will help you as much as possible. They will tell you as much information um, as, as they can so that you can make representations. I mean, what if it's a national security case, though? How, how do you deal with that? Well, in those cases, we have special advocates where you have your regular lawyer who deals with all the stuff in open court, but then the government appoint a lawyer who's all security cleared, and they can make arguments on your behalf using what we call closed material. So they'll take instructions, say, what's your defence? Okay. And then they will go off in private with the prosecutor and say, well, you know, we have all this evidence about the fact that we've got an undercover informer or we've bugging things or we've got spies or we've got this from another intelligence agency. 
And that advocate makes all the arguments they can on behalf of the defendant, but they're not allowed to communicate with the defendant or indeed anybody else. Um, you know, what discussions are being had. They call it, you know, going closed, and they have, like, special laptops, you know, that are supposedly unhackable. I mean, they can sort of go back to the client and say, look, can't tell you what we're discussing, but, can I, you know, you, you can sometimes get information. Just tell me what about this. Tell me about that. What would you say if this was the situation? You know, so they, they do do their best. And to try and make it fair, I mean, obviously, a lot of lawyers just don't like this idea that, of secret justice, that you're not allowed to know what the evidence or the case is against you. But they sort of deliberately chose, um, you, you know, the most sort of like anti-government, lefty, radical lawyers that they could, you know, on the grounds that, well, look, you know, we, we're not just giving it to people on our side. We're, we're, we're vetting people who, you know, pretty much, <laughs> you know, hate everything we stand for. So they'll probably argue um, a stronger case. But it is a controversial issue. And they can use special advocates in uh, civil proceedings as well, where there are national security implications. I mean, that sometimes happens even on things like parole hearings. If there's secret evidence as to why parole shouldn't be granted. Um, then they might say, well, you can have a special advocate at the parole hearing. Uh, because, you know, again, if it's something like we've got under, you know, we've got confidential information about, you know, this particular person or their involvement with gangs and we don't want to reveal where that came from, then, like, say, you know, you might have somebody saying, well, I'd like to argue this person should get parole, but, you know, the person won't be in the room um, while they're having those arguments. So there you go. Um, I hope that's cleared a few things up for you. I mean, if people want more detail about this, um, give, us, give us a shout. But I think that's pretty much, um, you know, the, the gist of it. So anyway, as always, hope you found that vaguely interesting, vaguely useful, uh, reasonably vaguely accurate. I did actually go and actually read all the proper guidelines before I did this for once. Although I've probably forgotten most of them anyway. Um, if you did, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing. I'll say hello from the boys because I forgot to put them. So Lord Lumberduck says hello. And Cappy Barrister... Hey, hello. So there you go. Um, I was going to try and get out for you again today, but I left it too late and it's starting to get a bit dark. Um, but I will try and get out and about. Mind you, it's a bank holiday, so it'll probably rain. <laughs>